Um, I'd like to play a recording for you. Uh, the book is being made into an audio book, and I'd like to play for you the section record recorded by uh, a local actor whom you might know, William Lawson Culver. I don't know if you know this local thespian, who's originally a judge from Maine, be that as it may. He's playing Hadley, and so in this piece, he's reading the first part. Innocence, 1911 to 1919. We had the first blizzard of the season last night. After I'd gone to sleep, the fox came to me over the snow of my dreams like he always does. Head up, proud like, every 40 feet or so he stops and bends up his front leg, same as a pointer. He got his lightly through the white, his tail looks as thick as his body, and his chest and belly blend white with the snow. Four little feet take him anywhere he wants to go, but he won't go far. I know. He'll double back, then cross over his tracks, confuse us all in a game I know he would never to start. In my dream, I'm in bed, looking out the window. The moon's a bright sun, leaving shadows like daytime, and the long fur on the fox's back shines a deep red, feet and tail dipped in ink. For a second, he turns his head and looks at me, looks me right in the eye. That small, wise face has a mouth that looks like it's going to smile, like we're old friends instead of old enemies. I know he's thinking, catch me if you can, Hadley. Then he's off, no sound, tail tip flicking away and goodbye. I roll away from the window to my brother, who's curled up next to me. Now, I often slept next to Paul or Joe, but in my dream, it's always Charlie with me. I'm going to wake him up, so he'll go with me. I push his shoulder and shake him, and Charlie groans something. But I whisper, come on, let's go box hunting. He smiles a bit with his eyes still shut. Then so wide that nobody else can move here, he says, you're on. Next, we're pushing our boots through the drifts in the woods. Trailings make spider webs and shadows on the snow, and Charlie has a shotgun under his right arm. We're all full of talk and light. There's lots of different tracks, and we recognize them all. Wilcox Bend had all kinds of animals back then, but humans, there's only one of them. When we get down to the river, Charlie stops and points with the barrel tip to wherever that prize tail of our fossils and swept away the pattern. They were where his even spaced paw prints speckled the riverbank. It's so quiet in my dream I can hear snow slide off the ends of cedar trees and push on the shadows below. I take a deep breath, and the air is so cold it makes my chest hurt. The water whispers under the river's ice while our long coats swish against our legs. We're two happy boys out there with all we have in love. Then a shot jumps out at us from the hills. The echo bounces off the bluffs back and forth until it sounds like it's all around us. Charlie's shotgun comes up and he reaches without even thinking for the wood under the barrel. Tick slides off the safety. He points the gun up the ridge above us, and I twist around and stare at the guy down the river. We stand there, back to back for a bit, but we never see or hear nothing else. It ends there. There's only the snow and tracks under the moon and ice on the roof. I can feel the warmth of my brother's back pressed up against mine, and I know that gun's ready to go. I've been having that dream for over 70 years now. Next, next slide. Thank you so much for coming, and many thanks to the Missouri Archives um, for having me. But before that, thank you for the archives and the people and the archivists and all the people who dedicate their time and volunteer many, many hours documenting history. Really, without that, this book wouldn't have been possible. Bet between this society here, or the State Historical Society, the Bushwhackers Museum in Nevada, Missouri, uh, the Western Manuscript Collection at the University of Missouri. It's just impossible to do historical research 
to any great depth without these different organizations. So thank you. Thank you very much. So what I'd like to talk about today is the research and the writing, kind of the, some of the backstories behind the book. I know you've read the book, some of you have read the book, and you don't want to hear about that, and some of you haven't read the book, and I want you to read the book, and it's written as a bit of a mystery, so I'm not going to tell you what happens in that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the writing of it, and um, the, I guess kind of the umbrella that would go over that would be the line between fact and fiction that writers have to struggle with, sometimes straddle, sometimes you get strangled by it. Anyway, for me, certainly that was a huge issue and I'd like to talk about that and how I made decisions and kind of the progression of the book. So go ahead and go to the next one there. So as you know, if you've read the book, I started, uh, I met ISIL, this is Thompson, when I was researching for this book. And at that point, I had two interviews left to do. And I saw had lived in Old Zebra, which today is called Osage Beach. It was really hard to find original members. And I was at the end of it. I had pretty much written everything. We had chosen the cover. And I, someone popped up and said, oh, there's, there's a, a resident, I saw Percival. And you should go talk to her. Her dad was the blacksmith of Zebra. So I went to visit her. And as you know, that's how I met Hadley. Go ahead and go to the next one. Thank you. So originally, um, I heard the story, and and I'm kind of jumping ahead in time, but as you know, it took me a year to go back and really talk to Hadley about it. I thought I would write it like this. This is academic format. This is the only format I have formal training in. It's nonfiction. It uses sources, and really, in a, it is in effect a documentation in the narrative. Sometimes it's a textbook, and sometimes it's a little it's a little cumbersome and a little boring for some readers. It just kind of depends on if you really like the subject matter or not, because if you love the subject matter, you want all these details, and, and it doesn't bore you at all. And that's originally what I thought I would do. So if we go to the next one. Um, so I meet, I, I meet ISIL, and I wanted to show you, this is, I, I wanted to bring some pictures that were not in the book. I have, I think, about 75 pictures, and only 13 were allowed to be in the book. But this is ISIL's family. You can see they're a very authentic Ozark family. Thank you. So the first time I sit down with them, and I'm so sorry I didn't keep this, but I really didn't think it was going to get this far. <laughs> it sounds like everything else, right? I didn't know it was going to come into this. But this is the this is the cardboard box that Hadley tore off a uh, piece, and here's the cardboard right here. And at some point, I copied it, and I, you know, before cell phones, I couldn't take pictures of things. I don't have a picture of Hadley and, and I. Um, I could have just made the whole thing up, really. I mean, there's no documentation that I was ever there. But anyway, um, this is the little little map that he makes me. And I sat there for two hours, and I was done with my interview, and um, he insisted on talking and told me this story, and I just turned on my tape recorder, turned it back, and I sat there for two more hours. And he, I, I was sort of mesmerized by his ability to tell a story, and also by the story that he was telling me. Now at that point, I had already listened to about 98 interviews, and if you've interviewed people, you know that usually your mind starts jumping ahead when they start telling a story. You try to predict what's going to happen, especially after a couple hours of sitting there, you're, you're, you tend to do that. But with Hadley's story, I couldn't anticipate anything that he was going to say, and when he got to the climax of the story, I just about fell out of my chair. It just surprised me so much. Next one. Here's the old boys here. So there's Joe over to the left, old Joe. There's Hadley in the middle. And there's his little brother, Paul, the one I called the Colonel. So um, there they are. They're at a Thompson reunion. Next one. And here is a, here's a, okay, this is where I take my life in my hands. Okay. Um, so here's a, here's a picture. If you recall, Hadley said, you know, we were friends. I, in the very beginning, he said, I just don't, I don't understand what happened because we were really friends. And then I got this picture. And I got this picture from his older sister, Desi May. Desi May 
um, it, if you recall, there was a there's a there's a character in the book named Pless Moore, who's kind of a really interesting character, and, and he's such a friend of the Thompsons that Desi May names her first boy after him. So this is Pless Popplewell. So he's a Thompson uh, by blood, and this is Charlie. And Charlie, you know, is involved in the murders very directly later on. And it's really interesting. There's not a picture of him that sh that sh is any better than this. He's always kind of in the back. He's always not front and center. Who is always front and center is Joe. Joe, the ladies' man. And I love this picture because you can see he's looking at Anita Crispin here, and uh, he looks. He, he looks uh, very friendly toward her. She also looks very friendly to the three guys that she's standing around to me. Looks like she's very comfortable. Um, I, I sit here and try to imagine who's got his arm. Does she have her arm around uh, Plez? You know, I, was, I try to imagine that. And this is one of the things that made me spend far too much time on this. I would look at these pictures and I would sit here and, and think about it and try to speculate and I could just do that all day and sometimes I did do that and I should have been writing. So all right, next one please. In the beginning, okay this is Mastin Mornell and this is one of his friends. And I just was wondering if by any chance the man who sent me, Greg Huddleston, are you here today? I just wondered if you sent me this email. All right, so in the beginning, like I said, I tried to write it. I thought I was going to write it academically, and I tried to write it academically. And I sat down and I wrote the story in a third person narrative. It's omniscient, it's like a textbook. Kind of like once upon a time, there was this place <laughs> along the river, and it's you know 43 miles from here, and it's this and that, and and there's these people that live here, and there's a family of boys here, and there's another family of boys over here, and I I just wrote it very factually, and I probably wrote about 100 pages, and I gave it to someone, and uh, to read. Because if you are one of my friends and you can read, you get stuck with reading things for me. <laughs> so anyway, and the reason there's no acknowledgement in my book is because I never kept track of all the people who were helping me. It was, but basically, if you knew me and you were really, or you were really related to me in some way, you helped me in some way. So anyway, um, I, I gave it to someone and um, I, I waited anxiously and then I said, well, what did you think? And I said, well, it was all right. And I said, no, I mean, I mean, did you, did you feel badly when it happened? Did you feel, well, you know, it was pretty much why, I, it was a story of a few, pretty much what I anticipated. So I thought, okay. And, and they said, well, it was kind of hard to get through, honestly. So I thought, okay, um, there was something here I need to tweak. So originally I had footnotes, um, little numbers in the text, and I thought, well, maybe I'll make it simpler. I'm bogging the reader down. I'm, I'm going to have just a lead in. I'm going to do everything at the end of the book, similar to how I ended up doing it in that one section. And I give it to somebody else to read. You know, it was like the same darn thing. And then I thought, because this is in both times now, I'm writing, I'm writing many pages. I'm not just writing a few pages. Maybe the second time I maybe only wrote 80 pages. I don't remember. I probably not. I probably just did the whole thing all over again. So then I gave it to someone else, same thing. And I'd, I'd say, well, what do you think of Hadley? Well, you know, which wait, which one was handling? And so then the third time I think I tried with this academic format, I decided that I would put longer quotes in there because I thought that he was often such a beautiful speaker. So normally in academic literature, we paraphrase long quotations. That's the rules that we're given. And we keep quotations only if they're really pertinent do we do the exact quotation. We would do a lot of paraphrasing. So, which I had done, and I thought, well, maybe I need to let the reader really read his voice. So I did some of that, and they said, well, I liked this section, these sections, but I didn't really like any of the rest of it. Anyway, I think I tried maybe four different, four or five times when I thought, you know, this dog just ain't gonna hunt. I gotta, I gotta do something else. So um, I went back, and what I'd like to read you now is uh, the story of Mastin Ornell, uh, who was the one on the left here, and you can see uh, his, he's got his Civil War medals here. I love this 
I love this picture for a level. Well, I love every picture I have, so you're just going to be used to be saying this. But um, I look at, look at where their hands are. I think that's really interesting, and that's just really a different sign of the times. They're showing their affection of each other, and yet, in today, you would not probably put your hand on another man's thigh and let someone take a picture. You certainly would never pose that way, um, and and yet these there are two um, two people. I believe, as it turns out, they went through the Civil War. They were in the same regiment from Bromley together, so they're very close. And I'm going to read you um, these two paragraphs, and these are exact, unedited words, actually, from Joe. Joe could often, just like Hadley, speak very eloquently, and I'll shut up and let him talk for himself. Okay, so this is a direct quotation. I did not do any editing at all. I just wrote down what he said. My mother, Myrtle Warnell Thompson, had the misfortune of getting pregnant while she was a teenager. You couldn't have done anything to a family that was more degrading. My mother had to bear both the sentiment of the people as well as her father's reputation. For her father, James Maston Warnell, was deacon of the First Christian Church of Bromley for 40 years and a Civil War veteran from the Union side. Grandpa Warnell had a mercantile business as well as a pension from the war of $50 a month. That was a lot of money back then. Pretty much made him king of Bromley, Missouri. Every Sunday morning, Master Warnell was right there in the right row on the left hand in the front row on the left hand side. Everybody knew that was his spot. That was his church. His wife and family lined up with him, and on winter mornings, the light streamed in through the tall windows covering him and his family, and the spot they sat in was warm and sunny. Everybody else sat behind Master Warnell, looking at his broad, strong shoulders and noticing his wife's new hat every Easter. So those, that is the way that both of these gentlemen could tell a story, and those are his exact, exact words. Later, after the book came out, so part of the story is, of course, when you write something like this, it never really ends because people come forward, and a gentleman came forward today and told me a nice story, and um, I would like it if you would email me that, please, because I'd like to have that story. Um, and here's one that I got. This is about the. This is about when Maston um, uh, had passed away. And there's a eulogy being read, and the man who's reading it is um, is the founder, is James Martin Hawkins, the founder of the town of Brumley. And ironically, the Hawkins Cemetery is where Hadley is and Isil is buried. And if you read the book, it's the one that on Decoration Day they go to. So James Martin Hawkins, founder of the town of Brumley, stepped forward and spoke. In his eulogy, Hawkins told the tale of how Warnell had saved his life during the war. With their regiment on duty in Arkansas, Hawkins, who had joined at the age of 14, became extremely ill, debilitating him to the point that he could not walk nor even feed himself. Warnell and the other Bromley volunteers cared for him as best as they could between duty shifts. When the order came for the regiment to move, it was quite evident that Hawkins would be unable to comply. As the regiment gathered equipment and prepared to move, the group of Bromley volunteers approached their commanding officer and informed him of the severity of Hawkins' physical condition. Upon consultation with the chain of command, it was decided that Hawkins and the others not able to travel would be left behind, counting on the humanity of the enemy to care for them. Arrangements were made, provisions left for the route, a year to figure out that she was a half-sister. I mean, there were just so many people in these things, and it just got so hard. Um, anyway, there's a little dog down here, Diner. Uh, he got kind of cut off there. Um, so they're in front of their home, the Thompson home, which is a really kind of a, a nice home. He, he said that, and I got some pictures of that to show that. Next slide. And here's Gypsy, uh, more dressed up, and she's playing around in the railroad yard. So that was the meeting place, either the bridge, the ferry, the railroad yard, that was kind of where young people would go and meet other young people, and that's where she, that's where she is there. Next one. And here's Grant's first family. 
Um, and so you know that he had two families, and in the beginning, I was trying to be very honest with the reader. And to me, honest meant, well, I have to tell you, I was always trying to be honest with the reader. But in the beginning, honest meant to then I tell you every detail that I learned. So I had to tell you about all these children. So I had to tell you that this was Grant, and this is his first wife, Emma, the one who was a pounder, you know. And uh, this is Desi May, and this is Clyde, and here's little Jim. And there's Annie, and there's John, the one that always has the problem. And you can tell even in this picture, he kind of, um, it looks like, if you had to pick which one was John, you probably would have picked that one. And I was doing so well, wasn't I? Um, this is Otto. Okay. So in the beginning, I had, you know, Desi May and, and um, Clyde in there, even though they weren't really part of the story or part of the family, my mind I needed to do that. And then I went to the second family. And at this point, I was now trying to write in Hadley's voice, um, but I decided that uh, uh, I decided that for whatever reason, I, oh no, no, I, my, my, this is about my fifth time to write the book. Again, twenty to eighty pages every time I do this. I wrote Hadley as an omniscient narrator, like, well, back in the day when I was born, you know, it was this and that, and then meanwhile, in, in in uh, New York City, this guy named Dixon is writing books on racial, you know, this and that, and as though he would know all this. And of course, readers question, how did he know all this? So then I felt like I had to invent other characters, like, oh, we had a friend who did research for him, and he came to the door and he told him. <laughs> it was really bad. Okay, so that, that one flopped. Um, and I said, and then go to the next slide, please. And here's, um, this is Wilcox Ben. In, in the 1920s, and so here's the, here's, this will be the farmland, and here are the bluffs coming up, so this is the in, totally infertile land, and there's the good land there that would often get flooded. And if you'd like to do the next slide, here we are in the 1990s. I took this one here, and so here are your shoals. Um, this looks like this kind of little fort at this point in time. Again, here's this would have been the farmland here, but now is um, just sort of a meadow pasture type. But at one time, I think that it was farmed. So there it is now. And and then here's Osage Beach. You can see there's a little tower of Osage Beach there in the background, and the river actually is going around like that. So actually, the Thompson Farm is kind of over here. Um, but anyway, uh, so I set it in. At one point, I decide I'm going to enter it in a contest because it's such a great story, right? So I send it in, and I've got all these people, I've got every family member that there is, and somehow I've made them a part of the story. And the, what I liked about this contest is that the judge was gonna write you a response. I, I wanted that, I wanted that criticism. Well, it didn't do real well, but, and this is hilarious, the judge said, I remember his comment saying, just because you were confused, do we have to be? <laughs> okay, next slide. So then I decided to do what I did, and I put that chart at the beginning, and you see that I put in bold the ones that are in the story. So I felt like I was still being honest with the reader. But I started kind of changing to, to well, if no one wants to read this story, what's the point? If you can't write it so that anybody wants to read it, Either just document it and give it, give it to the archives or the, the historical society, or, or give it up. So here is a uh, this is in present day. This is the Thompson home, Thompson farm. I mean, the re the river is down here, and this is this upper field. And I think I mean I can imagine how far down the river goes down here. So the the lower fields that would be like down along here, they would be flooded. But this upper field is the one that never flooded. And that was just really a prime piece of real estate to have back then, if you were a river bottom farmer. Okay, next slide, please. So in the researching, if you recall, um, he's sending me places. Eventually, it wasn't until the very end that I put myself into the manuscript. I kept trying to avoid that. So, but here I am, I have one picture, these are my research assistants, this is Jack on the left and Ace on the right, and here we are out in the, in the Ozark um, woods, tromping along, because they had to run all the time, and I was just, um, 
you know, I was pretty much just a normal housewife. And then I had this job as this rural his historian to write that book. But I also just had kids at home, and, and, and I had, we had these two hunting dogs that somehow my husband talked me into getting. And they had to run miles a day. So they were just, it seemed like they were always with me. And in the beginning, when I would go to interview someone, I, I would just pull up and kind of sheepishly say, do you mind if I let my dogs out for a minute? And all that. They turned out to be great icebreakers. And, uh, and they were really good ambassadors. So I put them in here. And someone asked in one of the book clubs if I had a picture of them. And this was the one picture I had. So next one, please. Here is the Prisman house today. And you can see how close it is to the road. So here is the road right here, and it is just like it, it was then. So and there's how close it is. So remember how they were landlocked in. Um, and that's, and that, that was very interesting to me, to see that and to wonder about that and to see how, if you had to always go this way, <laughs> um, you know what that would be and you were afraid of these people here um and again these people here i mean if these people here are shooting at you uh you don't have a whole you know you don't there, there's a pretty good chance they're going to hit your house um so next one and this is just the house today i went up there um a couple months ago and i asked there's a thompson relative up there and i asked who was living there and they said um but it's got black mold, and you can't go in there anymore. And I said, who owns it? And they said, oh, the guy in the trailer next to it, if he's not in prison. Um, so, <laughs> which I guess he was in and out of there. So anyway, there's the Christmas home, Christmas home, and it is still there today. Next one, please. And this is the road. This is today, and it's just like it was then. This is the entrance to the farm. So some people have said to me, um, if I go there, can I find it? Can I like drive by there? Well, no. You would have to be able to know that this road that you see is the Thompson Road, and and that it's pretty clear that you're you're trespassing. And by the way, there was a Thompson that lived right here anyway. So they don't own the farm anymore, but they do consider themselves guardians of the farm. And so, good luck with that. Don't <laughs> so at some point, uh, go ahead and go to the next one. <coughs> Oh yes, this is just showing how deep uh, the brush was. So there's Jack making him sit. Um, and this is just showing you how thick it is. I know a lot of you are from um, this area, and so you've seen that Ozark, um, those Ozark woods, and how incredibly thick they can be, and why the boys were able to sneak and get so close and not be seen. So um, that's just kind of a picture that's taken at the, at the um, Thompson Farm. So at this point, I, I start. I was in a writing group. Now I'm still trying to write the story. I've decided that since people like Hadley, I'm going to write him as a um, omniscient narrator. The reason I didn't, I, I tried using him. I think for like draft six, seven, and eight, I tried using him in his real language. Now the problem with that is, is that Hadley, like all of us, does, didn't talk the same way all the time. Sometimes, if he was in a storytelling mode, he was very eloquent. And then sometimes he um, would throw in a lot of angst and this and that, and, and he would just sort of talk in maybe what you might think of the more stereotypical country way. And sometimes uh, the, the language was interspersed with questions to me, comments to ISIL, and things like that. So. From the very beginning, I had a hard time with choosing uh, this language. I tried to be very accurate in the beginning. I was trying to be really honest. And when I switched, they would say, well, you, your voice switched here. This, now this doesn't sound like him. The reader would have in their mind what Hadley should sound like. And if he sounded too good, they would say, this obviously is you. Well, it wasn't. That was just sometimes when he got in, you know, he was going. He, like this part about Master Mornell. It was just beautiful, beautiful language. And then sometimes it kind of hunkered on down and, and um, he was a little bit more country about it. So they said, well, I, you know, I know people from that area, whatever, and I was always, it, it, they talk this way. So I tried writing it in that way. Well, then he sounded like an idiot. So, uh, so that draft didn't work. Okay, next, next one. 
Um, anyway, so I'm still, I'm still researching, meanwhile, the whole time, and I'm talking to people, and I, and I get really carried away with the research, I gotta tell you, because I, I really didn't know what the heck I was doing. I mean, I was working on it, but I felt like I was spinning my wheels. I kept trying, and then there was no. And I, people kept telling me, Henry Ford's thing of like, oh, you're not failing, you just found 200 ways that don't work. So anyway, um, <laughs> it made me feel much better. But so to hide, I would just go for research. So this is from the State of Historical Society. And I would just get carried away with things like this, like this thing, oh, this was written, I don't know if you can see it, but it's the State Supreme Court Justice is writing this dissertation on why, this is, and I, it, it says, he's talking about why uh, in the past election, I don't remember, either the Republicans or the Democrats did or didn't win. And he's writing it to someone else. And I just thought, well, the times are so different that on his state seal um, stationery, he's going to write this whole thing. And I got it from that library because of the, the mention of the Klan. So I got totally carried away. I had to sit here and I had to read. This was like six pages and I had to read all of it, even though most of it, this is the only part where he talked about the Klan. Uh, and so I totally over-researched that part. Next one, please. And here's some other things that I have. And on the, in the display case out there, by the way, there's some materials if you want to see, if you didn't see those on the way in. Um, so here's this uh, really interesting file I bought called the Mumford file. For those of you who are World War I buffs, um, so this is our Citizens Committee on Propaganda, and they were put together, leading citizens in the area were put together, and they had all these things that they were supposed to do to make sure people were pro-war, and they would support the war effort. And these are all the telegrams that Mr. Mumford kept, and, and I just found them fascinating. So I go off on this tangent. I probably spent three days you know, at that library just reading the Mumford files. So in some ways, I did get a good background um, for some of these things. It made me feel more um, confident when I would be making statements, because there's nothing worse than when you're someone like me that you don't, you were not a history major. I did not spend four years studying World War I in school. And I can very easily, you can read a book, and well, what if that book turns out that everybody else who knows the field says, well, that book, everybody knows, we discredited him years ago. So it made me feel a little bit more secure, I guess, to over-research and I'm probably just rationalizing, but I would just sort of hide in the library and read all this stuff that peripherally had something to do with the feud. Next one, please. And then there were these wonderful, um, these wonderful court documents from the Miller County Courthouse, and then when, when the fighting started, and this one was Logan Hickey, was the state of Missouri against Logan Hickey, Leo Christman, Sarah Christman, the mother, and Ben Barron. Now, if you read the book, there's no mention of Ben Barron. Um, so this is an area where I think, you know, was, I started having to make choices of leaving things out. So Ben Barron, I didn't, well, there were already so many people in the book anyway. And, and uh, I didn't find his family. I really couldn't find a follow-up. I have no idea. Maybe he, maybe he didn't, was never convicted of anything, you know? Maybe he was just sort of there and they filed suit and then later maybe his name was dropped off of that. I never really could, so I just didn't mention him. Um, so there I am straddling uh, that line where am I, I'm not telling the, off, the reader everything. And I'm doing it because I, I want the reader, at this point I've made the decision, I want the reader to read the book. I want them to want to get to the end of the story. And these things that made him trip, or her trip, uh, I was trying to take out, if they really weren't a part of it. And uh, he was involved in some way, but not a way that I could find out, or I choose to pursue, and part of that was because of the lack of the family. I didn't feel comfortable doing that if I didn't speak with anyone who knew him. Okay, next one, please. So here's the big, here's the baby. This is uh, when Leo, uh, Leo's son, Fred Christman, I finally found him at the very end. And now I had, I decided at this point, by the time I got this, I had already decided that I was going to write it in the two voices like I'm doing, like I did, and it had swollen along pretty well. And it bothered me, though, because I didn't ever have the Christmas side of it. 
I could just imagine a Christmas side. And I was trying to do that, trying to be fair, and other people had said things about the Christmas, that they were a very well-respected family. And then I, I did one of these things where I was on the internet and I joined like, I don't know, Ancestry.com or something like that. And it wasn't giving me anything. And I was about to stop the subscription. And I thought, I'll try one more time. And I remember I was visiting my daughter in college and sitting in her library and I just plugged in the name Fred Christman and I got a hit with a phone number. I went outside, I called this phone number and it turns out, he said, well, I'm actually, we, that was actually my dad and I just kept his phone number, but I, I inherited the house and I kept the phone number, but I found the family. And this is, uh, so this is the Fred Christman who um, gave, gave me the certificate and he was Frederick Christman's grandson. And you know, you can, in the book it talks about that relationship and how thankful I was that he told me his side and that he had the two, um, he had two recordings of his dad, Leo, telling their side of the story. So I learned a lot from the certificate. I also learned uh, to, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a better writer than I am a speaker because when you write, of course, you can redo, redo, redo. Uh, but when you speak, you can't do that. And I had to learn to be careful because this certificate, it has all this ornamentation along here. And the colors are the colors are true of the one that's out there that's grown up. It's fairly big, it's like 11 by 14. And I had to be careful because of the connotation of the words, not to use a word like, um, I can say elaborate, but I can't say beautiful. I mean, I don't want to say that because it sounds as though I am uh, then condoning this organization. I'm just talking about the certificate, but you just don't want to get involved in something like that. And I learned a lot about those connotation of words when I was reading the newspapers. And they would say, uh, you know, 20 Klansmen in full regalia, that word regalia, that, that is like the Civil War veterans, they wore regalia, or, or your, your, your minister, or, um, you know, or a king or a queen, and sort of all good things. And so I, I just uh, sort of had a study in connotation, and it did teach me to be careful myself, as well as to ponder when I heard certain words that were positive, um, uh, and they were directed at something that was not positive. So it made me, made me think about it, probably put another year or something, but I had to think about things like that. Okay, next one, please. All right, this is when I was when I would go out and research. Now, I never went anywhere that someone didn't call ahead of time, and I had an appointment. I didn't just like knock on someone's door, but I just thought this was such a hoot. So we got two no, no trespassing signs and the vulture. And this is the, door, <laughs> this is the driveway. <laughs> Gosh, what have I got myself into? Okay, uh, let me take a picture. Um, next one, please. Here is uh, Mr. Cox, uh, Simon P. Cox, the circuit preacher, and he's mentioned in the book, and we don't get to see him. He's on that, that scene about the day Barney got saved, and, and uh, I just thought you might like to see him. There he is at a wedding. Okay, next one. This is Plesmore, and here's another one, and it's just like the one, looks just like the one in the book, and I didn't realize I had two of them because he loves this pose. He's always posing just like this, and I like this. I don't, I don't, you notice his little cuffs here that he hasn't had time to get hemmed or something? Was it because he was a bachelor? Um, did he just buy the suit and had to run off and get it taken, you know, the picture taken because he looks so good? But anyway, um, there's Ples. I didn't use this one in the book because it has ink spots on it. But I like it for the cuffs, and I loved his shiny shoes. And that was a that was a, a source of irritation for people that his shoes were shiny. Because if you're a working man, you're not walking around with these shiny shoes on. You were to be suspect. But the Thompsons didn't feel that way. Next one. And if you are interested in Tuscumbia, Missouri, and seeing the old courthouse, I just want to show you that it's still here. So this, the, 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 they actually have the trials upstairs, and it's in the back. And it looks, there's nothing back here, it's just because it drops off against the river, it's so up on the river bluff. So it's really beautiful, it's still there. Um, you can look in the windows. Thankfully it hasn't torn down, been torn down. I think they, people have tried to do something with it, and it's just, you know, going to take so much money. 
that's probably not going to happen that soon. So, and I think we have a few more here. Yep. Okay. So next one, please. And this is um, a Thompson from the barn that's in the that's in the book. Um, this is the barn the boys built. Um, and outside, or no, I think right here on the table, I have the foundation, a close-up of the foundation of the, of the barn that shows the rifle stock and the, and the pipe that was that the boys put in, put in there. And if you go to the lake, you can see a Thompson farm. I see it, I wait at it all the time. As you come down into Meats Flats, before you come to the first, so you're on 54, you're heading down to the lake, before you come to the first light, which is Business 54 and Osage Nationals on your left, there's a flat area and you'll see a sign, there's a big billboard on your left that says Bad Donkey <laughs> Tattoos. And on the right, a little bit farther, there's a barn sitting by itself. It's a beautiful old barn that has a new roof on it. Those were built by the Thompson boys after the murder. They, they were, were good little barn builders and they built a number of barns in the area. <laughs> Next one. All right, and then finally, I just, this is just for the writers of, of you out there. After I got done and I finally ex decided what I was going to, how I was going to write it, and I had it in these vignettes. This shows you what I had to do to figure out to make sure it made sense. Because I kind of moved things around in time, like those decoration day times. Well, you know. You wouldn't remember. I mean, Hadley didn't remember. If, oh, this happened at Decoration Day. Was I 11 or was I 12? Was I 9 or was I 10? What was the order? I mean, he would know the sub order, but again, I had to take leeway there. I had to put him in some kind of sensible order. Whether or not it really happened that way, I don't think so. Probably not, because I don't think I'd be that lucky to actually get it exactly right. So, so at the end, this is what I did before public trying to go to publication. I would write out, this would be um, the characters, and this would be um, the different vignettes or the chapters. And I'd be writing out what every character was doing. So then by the time I got to you know, chapter 10, uh, I would introduce Plesmore twice, you know, to make sure that, I, that it was in some sort of order to check myself, because it got so convoluted, I, I couldn't figure out any other way to do it. Next one, I just have a couple more on that. This is the narrative arc, then up, up there, making sure that the events that I'm writing on are still doing that. This is something else that I decided not to worry about, another arc. Okay, and last one. And there it is all together. This is butcher paper, and you can see this is how big it is, but I look, look, get, put it all out. Um, I'm just trying to check myself and make sure that I, I did it right. I, and I probably still missed something. And then I'm going to finish up with this last one. Um, and so people always ask me, are you writing something now? So I decided this was such a heavy, ponderous subject. <laughs> I'm writing fiction. And, um, and so my daughter is the cover artist. Uh, she, she just submitted that box to the publisher, and they liked it, and they chose it. And then she did this. She went to Greece. And for those of you who are classical, um, the mythology lovers, you know that this is Odysseus um, trying to hide on the belly of the ram from the Cyclops. And anyway, it inspired me. And I'm writing something totally different, having nothing to do with Greek mythology. But anyway, with that one, I will end. And thank you again for coming. And thank you to the Missouri Archives.